Well, welcome everybody to this talk sponsored by the Institute of World Politics. For those of you that are new here, uh, IWP is a graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs. We offer a doctoral program, seven master's degree programs, including two that are online, and 18 certificates of graduate study. If you are at all interested in learning more about us, please feel free to visit iwp.edu. To support the work of IWP, please visit iwp.edu backslash donate. Today, we'll be hearing from Dr. Norman Bailey, who will discuss MENA, a summary and forecast. The lecture is part of a series on the MENA region, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and parts one through five can be found on IWP's YouTube channel. Dr. Norman Bailey is an adjunct professor of economics and national security at IWP and a professor of economic statecraft at the Galilee International Management Institute. Dr. Bailey was a senior staff member of the National Security Council during the Reagan administration and of the Office of the Director of National Intelligence during the George W. Bush administration. If you're joining us on Zoom this morning, please send in your questions via the Q&A function. And for those of you joining us on the live stream, feel free to add any questions you may have in the comments section. With that, please welcome Dr. Norman Bailey. Thank you very much, Sean, and welcome to everyone to the uh, sixth and last uh, talk of this uh, series on the MENA region, the Middle East, North Africa. Uh, that's the entire region between Morocco in the west and uh, Iran in the east, uh, predominantly Arab, but with large Turkish and um, Persian um, populations, uh, smaller populations of uh, uh, Jewish origin, um, uh, and as well as uh, Kurdish and uh, Berber, uh, predominantly uh, Muslim, uh, although having said that, uh, divided between the two major sects of Islam, uh, the Shia, to which uh, the uh, majority of the, the Arab population belongs, and uh, these two segments of Islam are mutually hostile. <clears throat> As usual, I'm going to start with uh, some of the uh, important events that have taken place since our last talk in um, September. Uh, and then I will uh, have pause for any questions or comments that you may have. Uh, and then I will continue with the main subject of today's talk, uh, which is the uh, um, the MENA region uh, and, and uh, developments uh, in, the, in the entire region, review of, uh, of the region by country by country. Okay, there are three major developments that took place since our last uh, get together uh, a month ago. Uh, one reflects well on US foreign policy and the other two reflect poorly on US policy. Uh, the development that uh, reflects well on U.S. policy is the agreement that was reached, uh, brokered by the United States uh, between Israel and uh, Lebanon on the division of their territorial waters, uh, which is a, a, a negotiation that's been going on, on and off for several years, uh, the importance of which is because of the, uh, uh, the discovery of uh, large deposits of natural gas in the Eastern uh, Mediterranean. Uh, a, uh, an agreement was reached between Lisbon, uh, Lebanon and uh, uh, the United States and between Israel and the United States because it, the, the United States acted as the uh, counterpart for both countries since uh, Lebanon does not recognize Israel. Um, and uh, it is uh, a good agreement. Uh, it it uh, divides uh, the uh, areas uh, that are in dispute uh, in such a way that uh, uh, the, uh, the, the southern um, field um, is entirely within Israeli waters. Uh, the northern field is 83% uh, within Lebanese waters. And uh, the um, revenues uh, from the uh, northern field will be um, divided in that proportion, 83% for Lebanon and 17% for uh, Israel. Uh, the revenues uh, from the, um, the northern field, which is called the Sidon field, 
will uh, be uh, received by the French uh, oil company Total, uh, which will be developing that um, uh, deposit. Uh, and uh, the Israel will receive its portion before Lebanon's portion is uh, distributed to Lebanon so that uh, there will be no uh, argument uh, with reference to that. Uh, and um, in any case, uh, they, Israel also got uh, a uh, territory, uh, territorial waters uh, up to uh, five kilometers off its shores for uh, security reasons, uh, which is a definite uh, advantage. Uh, and um, the, uh, once the, uh, the, the uh, a uh, drilling rig is completed uh, in the northern uh, region uh, because the drilling rig is already completed in the, in the southern region and will begin to produce shortly. It means that uh, the, the uh, terrorist organization that uh, very largely controls the Lebanon, uh, Hezbollah, uh, will have uh, every incentive not to attack uh, Israel because then it will have uh, Israel will have a hostage, uh, which would be the uh, the drilling rig for the the northern uh, uh, territorial uh, region, and um, and uh, that would uh, uh, of course eliminate uh, the uh, the um, revenues going to uh, to uh, Lebanon. Uh, the one questionable aspect about it is uh, that uh, the the agreement uh, says that um, the uh, the Lebanese portion of the revenues from the northern field uh, will uh, be paid to the Lebanese government and not to Hezbollah. Uh, that's fine, except that since Hezbollah, for all practical purposes, controls the Lebanese government, uh, there is absolutely uh, no assurance that uh, the Lebanese government wouldn't turn all or part of it over to to Hezbollah. Nevertheless. By and large, it's a good agreement. It's a compromise agreement and uh, uh, enable Israel to begin to uh, immediately produce um, gas from uh, its field, the Karish field, uh, which it was uh, reluctant to do because um, Hezbollah has uh, not only been making threats, it has actually sent drones over towards the uh, drilling rig and um, uh, now it's highly unlikely to, to attack. So Israel can uh, immediately proceed with the production of natural gas and sale of natural gas from the uh, Karish field. Uh, the second uh, development, <clears throat> which is uh, reflects poorly on uh, US foreign policy, uh, is one in which uh, there are no heroes uh, there and, and uh, it, it's an extremely disturbing uh, development. Uh, that is the uh, the decision on the part of the OPEC um, oil cartel plus uh, a couple of other countries, including Russia, uh, to uh, reduce um, oil production by uh, two million barrels a day. Now this goes directly contrary to U.S. policy, which uh, U.S. wants uh, oil production increased uh, because there is uh, a, uh, the problem with uh, the uh, boycott of, uh, of Russian oil now uh, to the rest of the world, and uh, particularly Western Europe, in this case, in Western Europe and North America. Um, Biden uh, went to Saudi Arabia precisely to try to convince the uh, Saudis to increase uh, sales. And uh, instead of that, uh, in the OPEC plus meeting, uh, the Saudis um, decided that they wanted to decrease uh, in order to sustain the price. And um, it uh, managed to achieve a, a majority and that is now OPEC policy. It's interesting that um, several of the Gulf states asked prior to the meeting, asked the Saudis not to reduce, to promote re the reduction of uh, production, oil production. And the Saudis ignored that and went ahead with, uh, with promoting the, the reduction, which was uh, voted uh, favorably by 
uh, by the entire OPEC group. This, of course, infuriated the American um, administration. Uh, nevertheless, we have to keep in mind that uh, during the, the campaign for president and uh, for quite a period of time afterwards, uh, the Biden administration was very hostile towards Saudi Arabia uh, and said that uh, American uh, uh, relations with Saudi Arabia needed to be rethought and, um, and uh, blame Saudi Arabia and particularly the crown prince uh, who actually runs the country um, for the death of uh, the, uh, uh, the Saudi um, journalist uh, Adnan Khashoggi uh, in Istanbul. And um, when Biden went to Saudi Arabia having now decided that it was important to get the Saudis on our side, uh, he, uh, his uh, negotiating technique could not have been worse uh, because he started his conversation with the crown, crown prince uh, uh, mentioning the, the Khashoggi, uh, the matter, uh, which uh, of course um, infuriated the crown prince and uh, Biden left obviously having accomplished absolutely nothing. Uh, and uh, now we see that there is a major rift between the U.S. on the one hand and Saudi Arabia on the other hand, which is uh, very, very serious because, of course, the Saudis are one of the principal elements, contrary to the Iranian effort to control uh, the northern part of uh, the Middle East. And um, the third development has to do with Iran, and that is uh, the, uh, the death in, in uh, police custody by a young Kurdish woman uh, for having her hair not sufficiently covered by a hijab. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the demonstrations and riots that have been going on in um, Iran since then, uh, which have uh, gone on now for several weeks without showing any sign of reduction uh, of importance. It's now covered the whole country. It began in the Kurdish region. It spread to the Baluchi region uh, in um, uh, southeastern um, Iran. And it now pretty much has covered the entire country. Uh, the, the police were uh, completely um, unable to control the situation. Uh, so they have uh, been replaced by the uh, the regime's uh, thugs, uh, the so-called Basij uh, forces, who are uh, basically a paramilitary uh, organization. Um, and and it, there are signs now that uh, the, uh, the Basij may have to be replaced by the Revolutionary Guard uh, and or uh, supplemented by the Revolutionary Guard. Uh, this, this is, is different in size and, uh, and uh, persistence from previous demonstrations against the regime, which have been taken place uh, periodically. And uh, the most serious one was during the Obama administration and the Obama administration did absolutely nothing to, to assist uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, demonstrators. Uh, and um, unfortunately, the Biden administration is following that same policy. Uh, it has, of course, said that uh, uh, it, 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 it supports the demonstrator, but has done nothing effective. Um, and this can be contrasted with uh, uh, the way the, uh, the uh, Reagan administration uh, uh, responded to the, uh, the rioting and demonstrations in Poland by the Solidarity Organization, uh, where um, uh, financial uh, support was provided uh, fax machines and other equipment were smuggled into the country to uh, support the uh, uprising. Uh, nothing of this sort has been done either by the United States or by the European countries. And not only that, but the obsession of the Biden administration with trying to reach an agreement uh, to replace the, uh, the former agreement uh, that was um, uh, left uh, uh, that the United States was withdrawn from it by the Trump administration, 
uh, is still in place. Uh, and instead of saying this, this, this is the end of it, uh, there's no question now uh, of any kind of agreement with Iran. Uh, the Biden administration still claims that it wants to reach an agreement with Iran, despite the fact that the previous agreement was violated from day one uh, by the Iranian, Iranian government. And uh, at this point, uh, this uh, reflects very poorly on, um, on U.S. foreign policy. Um, Sean, let me uh, pause here. To, and if anybody has any questions or comments with reference to these three developments since our last meeting. So far, so good, Dr. Bailey. We're good both on the uh, Zoom call and the Facebook. Okay. Um, so what now going into our principal topic uh, for this talk, which is a country by country view of where things stand now in the medium region and some speculation with reference to how things may go on in the future. Um, we'll go from, uh, from west to east, uh, starting with uh, Morocco and ending with Iran. Uh, and that's uh, uh, moving incidentally from one of the calmest areas to one of the most uh, uh, areas of upheaval in, in, in the, the, the MENA region. Uh, so uh, the Moroccan situation is, is, is very good. Uh, and the prognostication is, is excellent. Um, Morocco is a stable country, it's socially stable. It has a semi-democratic government uh, and uh, it uh, has had and continues to have uh, reasonable uh, economic growth. Uh, and now with its uh, agreement, uh, Abraham Accord agreement with Israel, it is uh, rapidly becoming a uh, high tech hub for uh, the North African region. And, and uh, it is the only one of the Abraham Accord countries that are, these are the countries that have normalized relations with Israel uh, that has actually an, a defense um, agreement with, with Israel. Uh, this is important of course uh, for um, Israel, but it's also very important for, for Morocco because of its dispute with Algeria over the Western Sahara region. Uh, and um, to the extent that uh, Morocco is able to increase its defense capabilities, uh, it will be able to hold off the Algerians. Uh, the, United, the Trump administration uh, recognized uh, Moroccan uh, sovereignty over the Western Sahara, and the Biden administration has not touched that, uh, that policy. So the future looks, uh, looks very uh, positive for Morocco. And moving over to um, Algeria, Algeria is a military dictatorship. It is uh, relatively stable. There have been no major um, political movements uh, against uh, the dictatorship in, in recent times. Uh, and uh, it is economically in, in good condition uh, because uh, it is being, um, it is one of the countries uh, that the European uh, countries that are worried about uh, natural gas shortages because of uh, the cutoff from Russia are going to, to get increased natural gas shipments so that uh, they will have um, a definite uh, in the uh, uh, export uh, of uh, gas and this will help in the economic uh, growth of, uh, of the country. Moving on then to Tunisia. Tunisia is a very sad situation. After the so-called Arab Spring, uh, Tunisia was uh, really the only Arab country that appeared to have been uh, completely democratized. Not just a partial democracy as, as you have in Morocco and to some extent also in Iraq, but a, a, a true democracy with uh, functioning um, executive, legislative, and judicial branches with uh, elections that uh, were, as far as anybody could see, uh, free and honest, uh, with uh, functioning uh, opposition parties uh, that accepted the result of the elections and so on. 
Then a couple of years ago, the president of the country started systematically dismantling uh, Tunisia's democracy uh, by uh, centering power in his, in his office, uh, by neutralizing the, the judiciary and by the, and the legislative branch, by holding uh, phony elections. And now uh, the people of Tunisia have uh, begun to demonstrate uh, against uh, the election. And this uh, will be um, uh, continuing in future as far as I can see. Uh, and um, uh, which, which side will come out ahead is hard, very hard to tell at this point, but it's really a shame because uh, Tunisia, as I said, was the one Arab country which seemed to be moving in the direction of uh, a true democracy. Okay, <clears throat> moving on then is to Libya. As we mentioned in previous talks, Libya has really become two countries, Western Libya and Eastern Libya. Western Libya is, is governed by the internationally recognized government. Eastern Libya is, uh, has its own government under a military leader, General Hafter, uh, the two sections of uh, Libya have uh, been uh, fighting with each other um, uh, for, for, for years. Uh, they are now under a, a truce. Uh, the truce has, uh, has proven to be effective, uh, but it's, a, it's, it's anybody's guess how long a situation of this kind can go on. Uh, Libya is no longer a functioning country. Uh, it is, as I say, is basically two different countries, one in the West and one in the East. And uh, each are supported by different other countries. Uh, the, the, uh, the Western government uh, is supported by uh, Iran and most of the, uh, uh, and Algeria, and uh, most of the uh, uh, Shia countries, even though it's not a Shia a Muslim area. Uh, and the, the Western uh, uh, portion is supported by uh, Egypt, uh, Saudi Arabia, and uh, the Gulf states. Uh, so how long this is, will go on is anybody's guess. We now come to one of the four most important countries in the MENA region, namely Egypt, uh, which has more than a population of more than 100 million people. Uh, Egypt is of course one of, the, one of the pivotal countries in the entire Middle East North Africa region and sits between the Middle East and North Africa. A small portion of uh, Egypt is in the Middle East, a much larger portion is in Northern Africa geographically, but geopolitically, as we have uh, talked about before, um, uh, Egypt is really part of, of the Middle East. Egypt is also a military dictatorship. It is much less repressive military dictatorship than Algeria. Uh, there is incidentally a sizable um, population, Christian population in Egypt, uh, about 10% of the population, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 million uh, people. Uh, and uh, the uh, Sisi government, the government of General Sisi, uh, who is the military dictator uh, at this point has uh, favored um, the, the Christian population uh, and most important, it has enthusiastically embraced its relationship with Israel and has supported the whole movement of the Abraham Accords and, and uh, with uh, the, the, the Gulf states with Saudi Arabia and their relations, uh, formal and informal with, uh, with Israel. Uh, that provides a very significant, uh, important um, uh, rock solid 
support for uh, that part, the southern Sunni part uh, of, the, of the Middle East. And um, it is, however, uh, a question whether there will become some kind of movement against the military dictatorship in the future. So far, we haven't seen anything particularly significant in this regard, uh, but um, uh, it could always happen. Right now, uh, the future of Egypt looks quite good. Um, it it uh, is, is in trouble economically because it imports uh, energy sources, but it is finding natural gas in its waters uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, and it also imports grains and is, uh, has a problem because of the Russia-Ukraine war. So the economic situation is questionable. So far, the regime has shown stability and we all have to hope that it will continue to show stability and uh, to continue to promote rapprochement between Israel and the Sunni Arab states of the southern part of uh, the Middle East. Uh, Sean, let, again, let me stop here uh, before moving into the countries of the Middle East and see if there are any questions or comments. All good to keep going forward, Dr. Bailey. No questions so far. Okay. Let me move then from Egypt to the countries of the Arabian Peninsula. Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Bahrain, the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Oman, and Yemen. With the exception of Yemen, which is a failed state, and which has been in a state of civil war for some years now, where the Houthi rebels are supported by Iran and the recognized government is supported by the Sunni countries, uh, particularly the countries of, of the Arabian Peninsula. It is, it is a, a, a tragic situation. It is uh, really uh, one of those failed states in the Middle East. Uh, which is, is, is truly tragic. Um, it is right now, there is a truce between the, uh, the two sides. Uh, that uh, truce has been off and on for a while. Uh, it uh, periodically gets violated by one side or the other, and then uh, it gets established again and, and so on and so forth. I don't see the likelihood of either side taking control of the entire country for the foreseeable future. And that means it is likely to continue uh, to be in a state of uh, basically civil war. And um, the rest of the Arabian Peninsula is quite the contrary. Uh, the, all of the countries that, that I mentioned from the kingpin, uh, the 800 pound gorilla in the region, Saudi Arabia, to the Gulf states of Kuwait, Bahrain, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, and Oman are in good shape. Uh, some of them are, have become semi-democratic. Uh, that's uh, the case in, uh, uh, in uh, certainly in Kuwait, is the case in the United Arab Emirates, which have legislatures, uh, which have some powers uh, where the uh, judiciary has some independence. Uh, none of the Gulf states is a, is a full-fledged democracy, uh, but none is a full-fledged tyranny either. Um, and they are all in excellent condition uh, from the standpoint of economics, particularly because of the increase in oil and gas prices as a result of the Russia-Ukraine conflict. <clears throat> Now, not only is this the, a very uh, favorable situation, but of course the Abraham Accords between Israel and in the Gulf region, Bahrain and the United Arab Emirates is a very, very optimistic development. And it is very likely that Saudi Arabia would have come to an Abraham Accord with Israel if 
the United States hadn't, uh, the US government hadn't uh, uh, messed things up with reference to its uh, relations with, uh, with uh, Saudi Arabia. Nevertheless, the Saudi extensive informal relations with, uh, with Israel and there is now substantial traffic between Israel and Saudi Arabia. Uh, the Israeli airlines have overflight rights now over Saudi Arabia when they fly to um, the, the UAE or to Bahrain or onward uh, to the east. Uh, and uh, incidentally, there are now 12 weekly flights between Israel and the, the United Arab Emirates. And the relationship between Israel and both Bahrain and the UAE uh, uh, couldn't be better, um, both from the economic standpoint, the political standpoint, the cultural standpoint. Um, and uh, the UAE has decided to be a, a high-tech hub for the Arabian Peninsula region, and the Israelis are uh, actively participating in that. And uh, all, of, all in all, with the, with the exception of um, Yemen and to some extent Qatar, which is uh, an outlier in the Gulf region, but including Oman, which is not cited, uh, has not signed an Abraham Accord with Israel, but is likely to do so at some point, and at any rate has good informal relations with, with Israel. Um, the situation with Qatar is unusual in the sense that there is a, an American uh, air base in, in, uh, in Qatar, uh, and uh, the US and, and the Qataris have excellent relations, despite the fact that Al Jazeera, the uh, uh, the news uh, uh, agency of, of Qatar uh, in its Arabic uh, version uh, constantly attacks the United States and the, uh, the other Western countries, um, and as well as, as Israel all the time. And the Qatari government uh, supports uh, several of the uh, terrorist movements uh, in the Middle East, North Africa region, including ISIS, Al Qaeda, uh, Hezbollah, Hamas, and Islamic Jihad. Uh, this this is is a very curious situation. Um, the Qataris have been able to balance one off against the other, and they were able also to survive a a boycott by on the part of the other uh, uh, Gulf states, uh, which went on for three or four years and uh, which was a failure. Uh, the Qatari government uh, cont continued to exist and maintain its policies. And now the boycott has been lifted. So that's a situation that needs to be looked at very carefully in the future. Okay, moving on to uh, north from the Arabian Peninsula. I'll start with, with Israel. Israel is um, a real paradox. Uh, economically, scientifically, technologically, culturally, and militarily, it is an enormous success. There are serious social problems with about 30% of the country not participating, at 30% 30, 30 of the population not participating actively in in Israel as part of the of Israeli society, uh, that is the Muslim Arab and, and uh, the Haredi uh, Jews, uh, the ultra-Orthodox Jews. Uh, and that is an ongoing problem which uh, has not been resolved. Uh, although it, um, in the case of the, of the Muslim Arabs, uh, they, they are beginning to get involved in uh, uh, the, uh, the economic life of the country and also and to some extent in the political and, and um, cultural life of the country more so than before. Uh, the Palestinian problem continues to exist. Uh, Israel, one government after another of Israel has uh, simply kicked the can down the road and 
and um, nobody has come up with a any kind of uh, reasonable solution. The Palestinian Authority shows no no indication that it has, has changed its policies um, and is likely to uh, come to any kind of agreement with uh, with Israel. Uh, certainly, the situation in Gaza with Hamas is one of hostility. Uh, both the um, Palestinian Authority uh, and its party, Fatah, and Hamas uh, claim that what they are interested in is is uh, the demise of, of uh, Israel. In other words, uh, that Israel should no longer exist because Israel occupies uh, what they say is the, the Palestinian homeland, namely uh, all of all of Israel. Uh, so that that problem continues and shows no sign uh, of uh, of becoming uh, better. Uh, however, there is one good aspect, and that is um, the Arab countries, uh, the uh, Sunni Arab countries, have uh, largely um, abandoned their former support of. Uh, of uh, Hamas and uh, and the Palestinian Authority, uh, with the exception of, um, of Jordan and uh, Qatar, who continue to uh, uh, to support the Palestinians. Other than that, the Arab countries, Egypt and the and the Gulf states, uh, with the exception of Qatar and Saudi Arabia, have decided that the Palestinians uh, can stew in their own juice and that they've got bigger fish to fry. Uh, so that that is a good development. However, the worst situation for Israel at this point is the political situation. Uh, Israel next month is going to have its uh, its fifth election in the last uh, couple of years, and this is is absurd. Uh, the country is divided half and half uh, between uh, the left and the right, uh, and you have the Arab parties most of which uh, do not participate in, in uh, the governments. Uh, you have the Haredi parties that are very anxious to participate in the government in order to protect their interests, which are certainly not the interests of the Israeli polity in general. Uh, and uh, this is the uh, politics has become more and more polarized uh, between uh, the extreme left and the extreme right in, uh, in Israel. And this is a very, very dangerous uh, uh, situation. And um, it, it, uh, there's, no, there's no assurance that a, a government will, after the election will, can be formed. If not, if it's impossible to be formed, then there will be a yet another election in another six months. And uh, if the extreme, uh, if the uh, right comes to power, with the support of the Haredi parties and the extreme um, uh, rightist parties, uh, there is uh, uh, the, the, the definite possibility of, uh, of substantial political unrest in, Rizio, in Israel, despite the success of the country from every other standpoint. Uh, again, from the foreign policy standpoint, Israel has gone from success to success, uh, and particularly with reference to the Abraham Accords and uh, the uh, situation uh, is it, to a large extent will be either determined by the election next month if the, the government can be formed, either a center left government or a rightist government. Um, and in, in the former case, uh, the outlook is optimistic. In the latter case, the out, uh, outlook is definitely pessimistic. Or if no government can be formed, and then you continue to have uh, political instability. OK, the situation in Jordan uh, is a curious one. Jordan uh, has a peace treaty with Israel, but it has never really uh, become uh, very friendly to, to Israel. Um, Jordan is has perfectly good relations with the other Sunni states. It has never uh, been particularly hostile to Iran, and it doesn't isn't a a, a, a target of Iranian uh, meddling, uh, particularly. Uh, nevertheless, it is entirely dependent on 
on Israel for both its uh, electricity uh, requirements and its water requirements, so that the possibility of any kind of hostility towards Israel is, uh, is out of the question from the economic standpoint. Nevertheless, uh, for some reason, the, the Jordanian government of King Abdullah uh, has not uh, taken uh, the attitude of the Egyptians uh, to uh, use uh, the, the new cordiality between Israel and uh, some of the Sunni Arab states uh, to uh, turn its cold peace with Israel into a warm peace with Israel. Uh, so that situation remains the same. Uh, uh, Jordan has an, a, a majority uh, Palestinian population uh, and uh, the uh, monarchy uh, is uh, constantly having to look over its shoulder to make sure that there's, um, uh, its Palestinian population remains uh, uh, more or less uh, happy. Okay, um, Lebanon. Lebanon, like Yemen, is another tragic situation. It's another failed state. Uh, the, the Lebanese government is bankrupt. Uh, the economic situation is terrible. Uh, the people of uh, most of Lebanon have electricity during two hours of the day. Uh, the one positive element is this new relationship with the, the new agreement with Israel on the United States uh, on uh, the division of territorial waters so that um, they can now develop, uh, the French uh, company Total can now develop uh, the uh, natural gas resources which are in uh, the Lebanese waters. Uh, but again, the country is actually run by a terrorist organization which is heavily armed, namely Hezbollah, which has thousands and thousands of, uh, of missiles and uh, rockets which have been supplied largely by Iran, uh, is uh, much stronger than the Lebanese armed, the official Lebanese armed forces, and for all practical purposes runs the country. Uh, this is uh, a very sad situation. Uh, I see nothing uh, in the future that is likely to, to change this in any significant fashion. Syria, along with Lebanon, Yemen, and Libya, is the fourth of the four failed states in the MENA region. Um, much of the country is still controlled by the Turks, by the Russians, by the Kurds in the uh, far western part of the country and by terrorist organizations, including ISIS and Al Qaeda. The government for all practical purposes controls something like 40% of the country. And these, all these other forces control the other 60% of the country. Uh, and there is no resolution to this in sight. Uh, the Turks uh, are not going to leave the country anytime in the foreseeable future. The Russians have established air and naval force uh, bases in the, in the Syrian uh, Mediterranean coast, uh, thereby uh, achieving a Russian goal from, from centuries ago, and uh, they're not likely to give it up. Uh, and they will continue to and the Iranians are all over the place um, and, of course, uh, support the Syrian government, which is a Shia government. Uh, the uh, Shia population of, of uh, Syria was about 40% uh, prior to the civil war. Uh, and um, the Sunni population are very largely Kurdish. Uh, and as I say, uh, the, the United States also has been involved in the country and continues uh, from time to time to uh, attack um, uh, a, 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 a base of, of Al-Qaeda or ISIS. And the Israelis continue to attack uh, Iranian installations in Syria uh, with, the, with the agreement of the Russians that they're not going to interfere which explains why Israel has never agreed to supply weapons to Ukraine. 
in the Russian-Ukrainian uh, war. And this is a continuing problem between Ukraine and Israel. The Ukrainians very badly need the kind of equipment that Israel could supply. And because of their agreement with Russia with reference to Syria, the Israelis who are perfectly happy to provide uh, defensive uh, equipment, to provide um, uh, uh, humanitarian assistance of all kinds and so on, will not provide uh, uh, heavy weaponry of any kind to, um, to the Ukrainian government. Uh, and that, uh, that, that policy is most unlikely to change. Okay, moving on to Turkey. Turkey, which of course is one of the major countries of the MENA region, along with Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Iran, uh, in terms of population and, and size, is a Sunni Islamic country. Uh, it has is in constant conflict with uh, part of its own population, namely uh, the very large Kurdish population of uh, Eastern uh, Turkey. Uh, it is in a very bad economic situation at the present time, and uh, it has galloping inflation, and um, it, it uh, has tried to maintain good relations with with Iran, with also with the Sunni countries. Uh, it has recently been in a, a charm offensive with reference to Israel, uh, which uh, and they reestablished economic relations with Israel. It has uh, supported and uh, continues to support Russia uh, in the um, Black Sea region. And um, it, 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 there is substantial uh, opposition to the government of President Erdogan, uh, which is basically a civilian dictatorship. Um, uh, the uh, the uh, 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 what was a flourishing Turkish democracy uh, has been to a large extent eliminated by Erdogan. There is a, an election uh, scheduled for next year. Uh, polls show that Erdogan uh, is not doing well, uh, but it's highly unlikely that uh, the election uh, will be free and uh, fair. And so for all practical purposes, uh, we, will, we will continue with uh, that situation unless the economic situation gets so bad that there is a, a, a uh, overall popular uh, movement uh, which uh, can be supported by uh, some of the security forces in Turkey. And we must uh, remember that uh, some years ago, uh, the uh, uh, Turkish army uh, staged a coup against uh, Erdogan, but uh, the coup was put down. Uh, so uh, it, it's, it has elements of stability. It also has elements of instability. Uh, this can also be said about Iraq. Iraq is a country which is, 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 has, is very strange. Uh, for one thing, it is one of the few countries that is a semi-dictatorship among the Arab countries. Um, its elections are, it has competing parties. Its elections are free and fair as far as anybody can see. Uh, it has great difficulty forming a government because of the um, the, the political makeup of the, of the uh, legislature when the elections take place. So you have a caretaker government in place. You have the Kurdish region in the north, which is autonomous. Uh, and you have constant uh, interference in Iraqi uh, politics by uh, Iran. So, but it's definitely not and it, 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 it failed state. It is not in the situation of a Yemen or a Lebanon or a Syria or a Libya. Uh, it's not a failed state, but it ha it's, it's, it's extremely unstable in various ways. And in other ways, it's quite remarkably stable. Um, and of course, uh, uh, the, uh, the Gulf states and Saudi Arabia interfere also in uh, Iraqi politics um, in opposition to, uh, to Iran. And at this point, the Iraniens uh, can continue, continuously 
not only uh, interfere in, in Iraqi politics, supporting various uh, parties in uh, uh, political, uh, and then politi political life in Iraq, they have also uh, staged military incursions into the Kurdish area in the north, uh, violating Iraqi um, uh, sovereignty. So this is one of the strangest situations in the entire region. So let's move on to the last of our countries, Iran, which is also one of the most interesting. Iran, of course, is a, is a the, the, theocratic dictatorship. Um, it's a totalitarian dictatorship. It, however, is extremely unpopular with its own population. Again, I will repeat something I've said before in these talks, but which is not widely recognized. Iran is only about 50% ethnic Persian. The rest of the, of the half of the, of the population are the various minority groups, uh, the Kurds, the Azeris, the uh, uh, Arabs, and the uh, uh, Baluchis in the southeast, as, long, as well as other more minor groups. And right now, the populace is in a stage of insurrection against the government. And it, it is, it is uh, supported, uh, the insurrection is supported not just by uh, the Kurds and the Baluchis and other of the minority groups, it is in the Persian areas also uh, and has been going on for some weeks now and shows no signs of, uh, of letting up. Uh, the, um, it, it, it is unlikely to succeed in overthrowing the government, however, unless one or another of the security forces in, uh, in um, Iran joins in. And of those, the most likely are the regular armed forces. And then you would have a real civil war in the country <laughs> between the regular armed forces and the Revolutionary Guard um, supporting the government. Uh, uh, the, the prognostication for Iran is very, very negative. Uh, and that will very seriously affect the rest of the Middle East, because Iran has been very actively trying to develop its, uh, uh, so its support and its uh, control over the whole, what is called the Northern Arc of the Middle East through Iraq, Syria, and uh, so will, and which is opposed by the Sunni Southern Arc with the exception of Qatar. Um, and uh, this will have a, a serious effect on, on, uh, on the region. The U.S. government, for some inexplicable reason, insists on continuing to make a deal, try to make a quote-unquote deal uh, with, uh, with the, the uh, Ayatollahs. Uh, this, uh, this I find to be extremely uh, strange. Uh, and uh, inexplicable, but in any case, it is the policy of the Biden government and the European countries have been going along with it. Okay, uh, Sean, this um, covers our review of the current situation in the MENA, countries of the MENA region, and some thoughts about um, future developments. So uh, let's pause here for questions or comments. Yes, we have a few, so let me run through them. Uh, the first one is, do you see the U.S. being able to repair relations with Saudi Arabia? And additionally, do you think it would be worthwhile for the United States to do so? Well, the second part of the question is very easily answered. Yes, definitely. I mean, Saudi Arabia is, is one of the key countries in the Middle East. And if the United States wants to retain its influence in the Middle East, uh, it has to it has to have have good relations with Saudi Arabia, which has it has had for decades. And uh, and this this uh, administration has been doing its best to to make the the situation worse. And this is one of the several failures of of u s. policy under the Biden administration, starting with the disastrous 
um, uh, evacuation of Afghanistan, uh, and and um, uh, certainly uh, the uh, the, the uh, situation with uh, the Saudi Arabia, which is which is just terrible, as well as the attempt to continue to uh, uh, make a deal with with Iran, which is about as hostile. Uh, in other words, you're, you're trying to make a deal with a country that calls you the, the great Satan. Uh, it, 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 it doesn't make any sense at all. Do I see any likelihood of, of an improvement in relations? I can't say so, no. Um, certainly, uh, Biden has, has turned the crown prince into a, uh, uh, an enemy. And uh, there is no, there's no likelihood unless the, the American administration uh, comes to uh, makes a 180 degree turn in its policy towards uh, the Saudis of any improvement in relations. Our next question uh, is, in your opinion, what do you believe will happen if Mahmoud Abbas dies or resigns from office? That is a very, very interesting question. Um, sooner or later, and probably sooner rather than later, uh, the Abbas administration will come to an end uh, by with his his either his death or his overthrow. Um, the what will immediately happen is that Hamas and Islamic Jihad will try to take over the West Bank. The U.S. has no significant influence in this development. Israel, of course, does have significant influence, and so would Jordan, except that uh, they probably aren't going to try to influence anything because uh, Jordan's uh, uh, policy has been to keep hands off to the extent possible. Uh, Israel, on the other hand, uh, has a, a very significant stake in not seeing that the West Bank becomes another Gaza. Uh, so. Um, there is a good deal of speculation that uh, that um, Israel, along with the United Arab Emirates, is going to support uh, Mohammed Dahlan, who lives in uh, the United Arab Emirates, to take over when uh, uh, Abbas uh, leaves the scene. And Dahlan has important a uh, group of followers in, in the West Bank. And with uh, UAE financial support and Israeli military support and political support, he could certainly take over the, uh, the country. And that would probably be the best thing because he would then be much more cooperative with, uh, uh, with um, Israel than uh, the Abbas regime has been. And that, in my opinion, would be by far the best development. And our final question is, what do you believe changed regarding the maritime deal between Israel and Lebanon? Uh, more precisely, why wasn't a deal agreed to between the two states earlier than this? I think probably because uh, the, um, the Lebanese situation hadn't reached a point at which they were absolutely desperate for some source of revenue. And uh, because due to the Russian-Ukraine situation, the price of natural gas has, uh, has rocketed. And of course, there is an unending demand for natural gas now in Europe because of the reduction in the Russian supply. Uh, and and um, it, it, it has changed. Uh, uh, seriously change of the uh, Lebanese side. <clears throat> okay, at this point, I want to thank everybody for attending, and I want to thank uh, Sean and uh, Katie uh, for sponsoring this uh, series of talks, which I have thoroughly enjoyed. Thank you all very much. We actually have one more question that just came oh, in. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, you're okay. Just came in. Um, what leverage uh, does the U.S. have with Turkey to counter their support to Russia in violating U.S. sanctions? Well, I mean, uh, the United States could simply tell the Turks this is this is this is unacceptable, 
And uh, if you continue with this, we will uh, we will uh, apply sanctions to to Turkish uh, uh, economic and financial activities. Uh, this is would be extremely effective because uh, the Turkish economic and financial situation is already extremely delicate um, and and getting worse. Uh, so that uh, uh, such an, an attitude on the part uh, of the United States would would certainly uh, be taken seriously by the Turkish side, and in my opinion, would result in their changing their their policy. Well, thank you, Dr. Bailey. That's I don't see any more questions either on our Facebook page or on the Zoom account. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And thank you, Dr. Bailey, for delivering uh, this great lecture series, um, six-part lecture series. Um, if you are at all interested in any of our other upcoming events, making a gift to IWP or applying to one of our graduate programs, please visit us at iwp.edu. And like mentioned before, uh, the other five parts to the MENA, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly series can be found on our IWP YouTube channel, uh, with this one going to be there uh, within the next week. So thank you again, everybody, and thank you, Dr. Bailey.